So we need to learn what those truths are. There's another area, though, that we need to address, and I've got a few minutes to address it about 15 or 20 minutes, in regards to how people see the church. So I want to show this one. This is a little bit controversial. Hopefully we've touched on the women things that you know, but watch this. There are famous actors who are openly gay. There's famous musicians who are openly gay. There's famous athletes now who are coming out of the closet and saying they're gay. We have to understand that in our culture today, there is more and more openness about homosexuality. Being gay is such a small part of my existence that to me, being judged by such a small part is crazy. If I wanted to go and, and be a part of the congregation, I wanted to go to a church, I truly feel that I wouldn't be welcomed, so I choose not to go to a church. The fact that I am gay would make me feel not open to, tell, to discuss that. I would have to be living a semi-closeted existence. Homosexuality. This is one of those areas that probably a lot of people have some very uh, difficult issues with me teaching on this particular area. I'm going to ask you to remember a couple of things. One is this is the perception that the world sees us with. Okay? The other is, is I want you to I want to challenge you to think seriously about some of the things I'm going to say and challenge you to go back and not just take my word for it, but to study scripture and research for yourselves. Okay? The reality is, is that the world, including non-Christian and even many Christian organizations, see the church as homophobic. And in some ways, the church is seen as an organization that doesn't not only disagree with people who are gay, the world sees the church as people who hate people who are gay. I'll challenge you that if God is anything, God is love and the display of hate. God hates sin, but God doesn't hate any I want to challenge some things even there. I want to ask you a question. I want to, some, of this, some of the process today is to get you to think. Y'all know the story about the woman caught in adultery? Y'all know that story? If that woman caught in adultery had been a lesbian and had been gay, would Jesus' response to her have been any different? Would Jesus' response to the woman caught in adultery have been any different had she been a lesbian or been gay? I don't think so. I don't think it would have been any different. But yet we as a society make it different. Let me ask you this. This lady right here on the video, and I've met and talked with many people. I personally have met face to face and spoken with many people who don't come to church for this reason. That they perceive the church as being an organization that hates gay people. Let me ask you this. If people of all walks of life are not welcome to a Savior who loves all people, where are they welcome? If we as an organization who says that we follow Jesus, the ultimate example of love and peace, and who loved whosoever, if we as an organization cannot love all people in the way that Jesus loves them, where and how will they ever hear and experience the gospel of salvation provided by Jesus? Here's the truth. Homosexuality is far more difficult to understand than many people give it credit for. You know what, I've run into this debate, I've been involved in this debate nationally across the world, and most people talk about one of the first responses from Christians right off the bat is this stuff about the gay gene, what's going on? And, and we're not talking about the gay gene, you know, the gay gene is a lot of study there. I don't talk about the gay gene because the reality of it is, is what's known of as the gay gene has bad science on both sides. Usually the people who are anti gay pay for a study, and their study shows that there's a gay there's not a gay gene. People who are pro-gay do pay for study, and their study shows that there's not a gay gene. I'm not talking about genes. You have to have some level of understanding of science. I'm speaking of chromosomes. Genes don't make up a person. Chromosomes do. There's a difference between a chromosome and a gene. Did y'all know that? Am I speaking above anybody's head right here? Does everybody understand this? 
Okay, what makes, what's the difference between a male and a female from a chromosomal perspective? Does anybody know? Huh? What? Okay, there's a little tip thing on the X that shows that there's, okay, does anybody else understand like there's X, double X chromosome, X, Y chromosome, if you've got an X, Y chromosome, male or female? Nobody know? X, Y chromosome makes up the male. Another type of chromosome makes up the female. Maybe I want a couple things here. I'm trying to get you to think rationally. Okay, those are chromosomes. Chromosomes make up male and female. If there are natural parts of the body that can be confused at birth, what I mean is that things don't come out normal. Does it make sense that there may be mental concepts or chromosomal concepts that also are messed up at birth? Does that make sense? Okay, anybody here ever heard of an amorphodite? Y'all know what an amorphodite is? One out of an amorphodite. One out of 100,000 people are born as an amorphodite or an amorphodite. That is an individual who is born with dual sex organs. Born with both female and male sex organs. Do you know how they make that adjustment? They, at birth nowadays, used to they didn't make the adjustment, but now at birth, they make a corrective procedure. Do you know how they decide the corrective procedure at birth now? Huh? Anybody else? The parent decides. Let me ask you a question. What if they're wrong? What if a person has predominantly male chromosomes, but they're more important as an amorphodite, and the parent decides they should be female? Y'all remember the story a few years ago, about two years ago now, the South Africa that broke the world record and was it the one mile or the 400 meters? Y'all hear that? Shattered it. And well, why did she break the record? You remember? She had dual sexuality. She was predominant. She had the appearance of a female, but she had chromosomal makeup of a male. One of the ways that God makes us different is muscle, muscle tissue. So these things exist. If in reality there is the possibility that there's there's physical confusion, does it not make sense that there can also be chromosomal confusion? It does to me. Now, in that, with that being said, let me challenge you this: Do we live in a perfect world? In fact, Genesis says we live in what kind of a world? A fallen and broken world. <laughs> things are not as God designed. If things were as God designed, here's a sounds kind of crazy, it's gonna be kind of humorous. If things right now were as God had designed, would I be wearing a shirt, a pair of slacks, and shoes? We'd all be naked. Adam and Eve were created naked. It was after they had sinned that they became aware of their own issues that they felt the need to clothe themselves. We live in a broken, I'm not advocating that we all start coming to church naked, they're rock, you know, whoever. <laughs> Uh, but we live in a broken and fallen world. Let me ask you this. If God cannot save and love a homosexual person, how can God be God? God does love and provide salvation to people who are saved. He can love them us. Here's my perspective. I feel it's important to do this. I'm going to try to rush through this. I struggle. I'm still struggling with this because I've been taught, I, even though I didn't go to church all the time, I've been taught what most people, even people who aren't gay, think of gay people. My whole life has been screwed up. But my requirement as a follower of Jesus is to not take what the world tells me to apply in my life. My obligation as a follower of Jesus is to take what Jesus has taught me by His words, by His actions, by His example, and to apply that in my life. And I'm still, I'm still searching for truth, the totality of truth. I don't, I'm going to confess to you, I don't have it. But here's what I know. I know that for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. I know that none of us in and of ourselves are holy. I know that a sin, whatever that sin is, separates us from God without the forgiveness and salvation of Jesus Christ. You hear what else I know? 
I've met gay people who I think love God and have a relationship with Jesus Christ. I've met gay people who've done one of two things that have decided to, on one end of the spectrum, I have people who have gay or homosexual tendencies. We all have sin tendencies. You might have the tendency to lie. You might have a tendency to drink. Or you might have a tendency to, to cheat. I mean, we can have all kinds of sinful tendencies that separate us from God. A homosexual component, if you look at that as sin, is a tendency that can separate people from God. I have people who are friends of mine who are gay who believe that they have a homosexual tendency and because of that tendency they've decided to live celibate lives and not engage in sexual activity. I commend them. I have other friends who are gay who, for whatever reason, just like the rest of the world, no kids around at the end of the day, right? I believe they can screw around however, whenever they want. And I'll call that diversion. I don't care who you are, gay, straight, whatever, that's sin. I have other gay friends where it becomes a little bit difficult. They live in monogamous, long-term relationships with their partner. That one becomes a little bit more difficult. We have to be careful of how we prejudge people. The actions of many Christians clearly show that we don't always act like Christians. We use unloving words in an unloving way to describe people who have different sexual orientations. We have jokes and language and attitudes that do not resemble the language and the attitude that Jesus had towards people. We throw stereotypes out not only towards women, but we throw stereotypes out towards people who are gay. I want to ask you, those who are gay in their past relationship with observations with Christians, don't feel like they can talk to Christians ever again. In other words, somebody may have grown up in the church and realized they would come out and for whatever reason, whether it's genetic or whether it's chromosomal or whether it's choice or behavior, for whatever reason, it doesn't matter. What does matter is that they feel they can't come back and talk to people who are followers of Jesus again. We make it clear as Christians, and this is again how the world sees it, but I think there's a lot of validity. The world sees it this way, and I think a lot of times it is this way. We make it clear we want nothing to do with those people. We don't want nothing to do with them. We don't want nothing to do with those whatever negative word that you want to pick and choose from. We may take that attitude, but in regards to having something to do with those people, in regards to loving them, in regards to caring for them, in regards to living and dying for them, we need to remember Jesus does. Jesus did. He loved whosoever. The word whosoever means exactly that, whosoever. And whosoever we come into contact with, Jesus has commanded us to love those individuals. Unfortunately, the church has become obsessed with homosexuality and it overlooks its own grievous sins. But think about it. What's the two hot topics for the church? Gays and abortion. We become so obsessed with the act that we forget about the importance of the individual. Jesus loves him, dies to die for him. See, the reality is there's a lot of sins. Now listen to this right here. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. Don't you know that evil people won't have a chance to share in the blessings of God's kingdom? Don't fool yourselves. No one who is immoral or worships idols or is unfaithful in marriage or is a pervert or behaves like a homosexual will share in God's kingdom. Neither will any thief or greedy person or drunkard or anyone who curses and shakes up some of you used to be like that, but now in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and the power of God's Spirit have washed you and made you holy and acceptable. Homosexuality is not the only sin that God has issue with. And even then, we've got to be careful because I'm going to the Word study here in a second. There's a lot of things up there that we fall into. Why don't we take such a stand against those? Why don't we talk about people who are greedy? Why don't we talk about people who cheat others and make a big deal about that? Because it's because, I think it's because oftentimes we have those sins or we are those people. We don't like pointing fingers at ourselves. We like pointing fingers at people who are different than us. 
Homosexuality is not the only sin, but why does it get so much attention? Because that's not who we are. We like to point fingers at others as opposed to looking at ourselves. I want you to consider something though about this passage and some other passages I'm going to look at real quickly here. The Greek word that's used for homosexual here, and again, don't take my word for it, go back and look at it. And it's consistent if you think about context here. It does not imply homosexual in the way that we think of that word. It is specifically referring to a male prostitute. It's talking about the perversion of male prostitution. In fact, if we go on, we can see that in verse 11 here, there's also an indication that no matter what your view, no matter who you are, what you've been, there's hope that Jesus changes lives. We can see that. Here's a quick question to give me as honest as you can, okay? I'm going to ask you for a little bit of response. We've got a little bit of our video coming. Does anybody, does anybody here have anyone, any friends who are gay? Okay, a lot of you raised your hand. Let me ask you a question. Speak up real loud, if you can. Uh, how did they respond, or how have they responded to the church? For those of you that have friends who are gay, what is their perspective of Christianity in the church? The ones I know have received Jesus and He has healed them. And they're no longer gay. Okay, Richard says you know some who have received Christ and Christ has healed them and they're no longer gay. How about someone else? They are a part of it. What do you, what do you want? Speak up, Lisa. I don't repeat what you say. But. They believe the church is not for them. You need to what? So. so okay. Somebody else back here didn't share it. Does somebody back here have something? Okay, yes, ma'am. They don't go to church at all. Okay, sure. She sure is friendly that the church is judgmental and hypocritical. Sure. Okay. Sharon saying that her friends go to a homosexual church. Her church is just for homosexuals. Couple things. Do we as uh, individuals like it when we're stereotyped or typecast as Christians or Native American or Indian or male or female? Do we like it when we're typecast and judged? I don't. I could tell you a long story about how I hate Southern, I hate jokes about how Southern people talk. We went to a church one time and quit going to that church when it was a good church. We quit going because the pastor was telling jokes about Southern people. There's this perception that people in the South are stupid. You know, forget the fact that we created the nuclear bomb, the laser, and all these other things. You know, forget the fact that Atlanta is one of the fastest growing cities on the face of the earth right now. <coughs> uh, forget about the fact that the abolition of slave movement started in the South. In fact, some parts of the South during the Civil War sided with the Union as opposed to the South. My home is one of those areas. I find it ironic that people from Johnson City, Tennessee, fly rebel flags. Because Johnson City, Johnson City, Tennessee, and East Tennessee, Jonesboro, Jonesboro was where Harriet Tubman hosted the publications for the Underground Railroad, which is a suburb of Johnson City. We were specifically pro union That's why it's still Republican. We sided with the party of Lincoln. So the assumptions that people have sometimes lead to bad things. How do you think other groups feel, though, when they're stereotyped with eternal consequences? Anybody ever heard you can't be gay to be saved? I have. If we get upset about the stereotypes against us, how do you think people where those stereotypes have eternal consequences feel? I don't think they feel too good. Now Jesus talks in the Bible a great deal about the poor. Why do you think that is? There's more references to Jesus and the poor than almost any other subject in the entirety of the Bible. Why do you think that is? Because if a poor man can find salvation through Christ, anyone can. A poor man can find salvation, anyone can. It's imperative that we show love to all people, no matter who they are, where they're from, or what they do, or what they do in the privacy of their homes. We need to show love. We have to show those people that have been taught to hate that love is greater than hate. We have to show people in the world that we can love even those we disagree with, those that we're different with, because... With God, all things are possible, and if God is anything, God is love. Love. Here's how we can begin to change. Here's how Mosaic can begin 
and can begin to change the perception on the areas of sexuality. We have to be open to discussing the issue regarding sexuality of all types, all kinds, and presented in a biblical view. I don't know why the church gets uptight when we can't talk about certain things, okay? The Bible talks about sex. I could, I could have you read some Bible verses right here, and I guarantee you that you'd blush when you read them. Okay? I could have you read about the kings and the queens who use dildos for all kinds of reasons, and they basically call it that. There's all kinds of sex acts that we see described graphically in the Bible. There's language. I won't even go there. I'll not be embarrassed to tell you. But for some reason, churches have this reputation that we can't discuss those things. We need to be open to discussing anything about the human condition. Why? Because God does in His Word. Why can't we? But we need to be willing to discuss that even with those that we may have a disagreement with. We have to be careful, though, how we teach and preach about sexuality. We have to address spiritual truths, not just feelings. There's a difference. You may have a feeling about something, the feeling is not necessarily necessary truth. We have to address the spiritual truths. We can't just preach about abstinence before marriage. I believe in abstinence before marriage. We can't just preach about that, though. We have to speak about the meaning of sex and the beauty of it as God ordained it and described it. You know that God compliments and praises and even has a whole book in the Bible dedicated to the joy of sex? Called the Song of Solomon and the Song of Solomon's. We have to address that, talk about it, build into it. We have to understand the culture that we live in and then address that culture with serious and after serious study and prayer. Otherwise, we're going on our feelings again. We have to be rooted in what God says, the actions of God, the attitude of God, what God's Word says, and then be involved in those discussions. We have to allow questions. Some of the organizations and churches don't even want you to ask the questions. And while we ask the questions or allow people to ask their questions, we have to respect their privacy. We have to let people know it's okay to ask. Okay? We just need to know the answers before we go talking to them. And if you don't know the answer, we have to say, I don't know. Let me see if I can find out. But we have to be willing to discuss. I've seen story after story after story of a young homosexual man or woman going to their pastor, going to someone in the church, and not getting the answers or being discouraged, and they leave the church and they end up committing suicide, some of them people. How do we represent God when we allow attitudes and feelings in such a way that people get so depressed they end up committing suicide? Again, we have to be aware of the Word, the Scripture, the translations. It says, you can go online now, BibleGateway.com or Blue Letter Bible, and if you see a word, you can outline it and it'll tell you what that word means. And you can go to the Greek lexicon or Hebrew X lexicon. And they'll tell you exactly what that word means in the English in the original language. We have to be aware of the different translations for the word homosexual, such as in Corinthians 6 9, where it's not specifically talking about all gay people, it's talking about male perverts who act like prostitutes. Okay, we have to be aware of those types of passages. That there's different verses that carry different connotations. We do this with Jehovah's Witnesses. Well, God, you know, God created Elohim, we read about it in Genesis and and uh, those Paul said the Holy Spirit, and what we don't understand is that really on that one particular passage on the translation of the Trinity, on that one particular passage, the Jehovah's Witnesses actually get it right. And we're arguing with them on that particular passage when we're right. Now, there's probably another 30 or 40 passages where they're wrong, and another 15 or 20 specifically related to the Trinity where they're wrong. But we'll stand and argue that one passage where they're right. We have to have an understanding of the Word, okay? couple things to be aware of in regards to wording and the way we teach. Anybody ever heard that salt and moral is destroyed because of all the gay people? Anybody ever heard that? I've heard it. Wrong. That's not what the Bible says. Of course, if you never open up the Bible, you don't know that. Ezekiel chapter 16, verses 48 and 49, and then Judges 19 through 21 and allude to the fact that it was because of your pride and arrogance and your refusal to care for the poor and needy that God destroyed you. Among other things that God destroyed you. That's a quote. Now I don't see that God destroyed it because of the homosexuality when I read that. I read that because of your pride and arrogance, your refusal to care for the poor and needy, among other things that God destroyed them. Now homosexuality or perverted sin, I think it was the perverted sin was the primary issue there, was the issue because if you remember the story there that takes place, you know, these people show up in the hotel wants to have sex with these guys. 
That's kind of called an orgy. It's a perversion at that point. And we focus on that and don't even mention that. It's those other things that's probably more important since God saw fit they were mentioned there. But then there's passages like Leviticus. You know, please, Christians who judge homosexuals based on Levitical passages, shut up. Because you make us all look like idiots. You'll use a Levitical passage that talks about gays being put to death and two verses or three verses down where it talks about if you need any kind of seafood, you will also be put to death and you ignore that. You also ignore the part that talks about if your son has sinned against you, you are to boil them in water and eat their flesh. If we're going to apply one part of Leviticus, let's apply it all. Otherwise, shut up and quit picking and choosing which verses you like and don't like. Okay? I hate to say it that way. But then there's Romans chapter 1 that addresses some things. In this particular area, Paul, again, uh, many people believe that Paul is specifically addressing, again, perverted sexual orgies, not specific to monogamous relationships. Now, I shared the passage of 1 Corinthians 6, 9, 1 Timothy 1, 10. Just, again, just like the Corinthian passages that a lot of Christians use, it's the same word that refers to male prostitution. It's not referring to monogamous relationships. It seems as if Scripture, there's about seven or eight passages of Scripture that deal with homosexuality. It seems as if all but one of those specifically refer to and relate to perversion. In other words, I'm going to sleep around, do whatever I want with whoever I want. Okay? If being fair about it, we have to be aware of what those texts say. Now, that said, there's a couple of passages that there does seem to be some indication that the act of homosexuality is sin. Let me ask you. I'm not sure on that. I have to do more research. I'm telling you. But that said, if the scripture says one time that a particular act is sin, is it sin? Yep. Yep. And I think the passage that gives greater credence to it than anything is that if you look at the creation of nature and how we were created, it doesn't take much long to figure that a sexual style in and of itself specific to homosexuality outside of the new science. The population would have died off a long time ago. So be aware of that. This isn't to say again that homosexuality is not a sin. But this is to say that we can be theologically sound and address the issues appropriately and in love in an accepting and loving way. We have to make sure we understand what we're talking about. Let me tell you this, if you don't have gay friends, make some. Get to know them. Know their hearts, their feelings. We don't exclude other sin groups. Why do we exclude that particular sin group? If we're looking at the sin group. We understand that homosexuals have been at Mosaic in the past, will likely be at Mosaic again in the future, and more than likely may be here now. I've spent some time with Kelly Savory. Some of you remember Kelly, a lot of you don't, but Kelly was a part of this church that came out of the homosexual movement. And he knows very well. In Omaha, he was telling me, I was speaking to him this week, he was telling me about some churches in Omaha. How many churches have signed a non-discriminatory pact against homosexuals? Wichita churches, those that are maybe watching this on YouTube or wherever, Wichita churches, Wichita people, we need to sign a pact that we're not going to discriminate against people based upon their sexuality. We will be a place that will share the love and the salvation of Jesus Christ. We will let the Holy Spirit be the cleaning and cleaning needs to be done. We can hold on to our biblical and natural positions. We just need to make sure that they're right. You feel that being a homosexual and a homosexual act is a sin? See, I'm at the, this is where I'm at. I'm at the place that it's not a sin to be in the gay tendencies. It's not a sin to be a homosexual. I'm there. But I'm also at the place that sex outside of marriage or sex in a perverted way, there's no doubt that that is sin. And I'm of the opinion, I'm of, and I could be wrong on this, this is my speaking, this isn't what I feel as God has led me to say, but I as an individual believe that if a person is gay and they have homosexual tendencies, just as I have the tendency to eat too much, I need to quit because gluttony is also a sin. I need to address that area of my life. That does not prevent me from experiencing salvation. And there may be a person who is gay that on occasion may need to cause back into the sin. But God's salvation and blood of Jesus on the cross was good for yesterday, today, and forever. The salvation is complete. We need to be loving and caring for those people just as much as we love and care for our brother or sister that maybe have some other sin. Now, I tell you, I'm still dealing with the issue. 
I'm telling you this though too. I I have no. I've got a friend. Uh, I've got a friend who probably watches some video. Russ Turner out of Toronto, Canada. Uh, Russ is a dear, dear friend, and he's living in a long-term, monogamous relationship, and he's gay. I think Russ is still searching. I'm grateful that Rush is able to focus on the love that I have for him more than he does the judgment and criticism of the church. I have other friends, and I may mention this, that are gay, that believe that as they read the Bible, they have to abstain from sexual activity. And I really admire those folks. They still have gay tendencies. But they, uh, as Richard said, there are, there's no doubt that there are situations where God changes. He provides things. And, you know, I, I, but there's other situations where maybe someone remains. I, I don't know the answer. And I'll get criticism because I, I, when I sit here and say that Rush has lived in a monogamous relationship, there will be people that will criticize me for that. But as a friend, I respect him for his decision. That type of relationship, we we can't find examples of where that's illustrated and spoken about in the Bible. You know that the concept of monogamous relationships among the homosexual community is not addressed in the Bible. 